Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, hey, welcome to the show today, Super Agents Live. And if, if you're new, thanks for showing up. I hope you like what we do here and what I do on this show. I talk with top producing real estate agents, coaches, and authors. Now, listen, if you don't sell real estate, that's okay. We're really talking about entrepreneurship, but through the lens of a real estate agent. Now, today's guest, I'll tell you, man, I, I enjoyed this guy. I like this guy. He's a really cool guy. He's in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, his name is Greg Harrelson. Now, this guy has three offices. He's got about 60 agents, and uh, we, we cover a lot of stuff. Um, I'll, I'll give you uh, sort of like a tweetable thing that he said, and here's what he said. He said, real estate is a contact sport. Every deal starts with a contact. It's like, man, that makes no so much sense. So, so bearing that in mind, real estate is a contact sport. What we talk about a bunch of stuff. We talk about you know phone prospecting and how to get better at phone prospecting. How to get to where you can make twenty contacts in an hour. We talk about why you should stay in your zone and perfect your skills before moving on. And I see this all the time with people. Right, that next bright shiny object. They start on something, and they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Let me s abandon the thing that I've been working on and move on. So he really says, hey, stay in the zone. Perfect the thing that you're working on. Um, we talk about personalities, and, and, and we, you know, we really get into personality types and how your DISC profile, and if you ha don't know what that is and you have not taken the test, send me an email, and I will send you a link, and, 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 and you can take it. But he talks about why your DISC profile may dictate what – type of business you will build. Um, you know, certain personality profiles lend themselves to being more on the buyer side. Other personality profiles lend themselves to be on the listing side. So um, uh, we talk about how uh, to get out of your comfort zone, how you can do that, why you should do that. Uh, and, and, and look, even if you're shy, how you can go out and nail it in real estate. So I hope you like it. I certainly did. Now, before we get to the content, as usual, a little housekeeping. If you don't or are not aware, the hashtag for this show is Unpack That Idea. Uh, we have a very strong Twitter type. Go. If you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter, man. Uh, follow the me uh, or follow the show. The ha my Twitter handle, the show Twitter handle is at Super Agents Live. If you follow me, I promise you I'll follow you back and you'll get more followers using that hashtag. Um, as you guys know, I'm building out the radio arm of this platform, uh, and I'm pretty excited. You know, we really only launched this thing. Let me talk to you a little bit about it really quick. You know, we launched this thing about two months ago uh, and saying, hey, listen, we're going to put and, – and we've been working on it for about six months in the background. Now, so far – and here's what I want to do. Now, as you know, we can only put one agent in each market. We are only doing – the top 100 radio markets across the country. So that's it. If you're in market number 132, and you know we can do ad buys for you for you know 20 bucks, um, it's we're not going to work in that market. It's just too too small for us. Uh, and the other thing too is the people that we we want on our team as clients, we want the tip tip tippy top top, top, top people. Uh, you know, for example, you know, for, for, for us, you know, uh, we, we have a guy in DC, he does a hundred million dollars, 29 years old. Uh, we have a guy in Dallas he does $200 million. Um, so, so that's really what we're looking for. Um, so, uh, if you're out there, if you're listening and you, you, you want to get on radio and you want to turbocharge your business, send me an email. And look, if you think it's just me out here working, trying to, trying to do the show and do the radio thing, I'll tell you, we, we have, we have a phenomenal team. You know, I have an ISA that is out there, and, and, and they work. You know, she's out there calling people. Uh, we actually, I actually have two ISAs. I have one person calling to get, for getting guests, and I have another person calling and introducing uh, the radio arm to the top people out there. Uh, we have a web person. We have, a, we have an internet marketing person on the team. We have a research person on the team, and we have a, a crack media buyer. So uh, we are able, uh, in some markets, like D.C., for example, uh, top station, top spot, 60 seconds. You know how much it costs? 1450 bucks. Uh, we got that down to 500 bucks. And look, don't, don't let that scare you because, uh, you know, we have a guy in Charleston. Um, rate card was 80 bucks for one minute. We got that down to, to cheap. We got that down to like 35 bucks, 50 bucks. Um, uh, well, 35 bucks and we got, two, we're getting, doing two stations for 53. So, um, you don't have to have a huge budget. Our minimum ad spend is three grand. So it's three to 20. And look, if you think three grand or five grand or 10 grand is expensive, it's all about the return. It's all about the return on your investment. You know, we have a guy, uh, we put him on the radio. He was on for two weeks. In that two weeks, he got three listings. 
Uh, his average sale is four fit four hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, his commission is about eleven grand. Uh, it cost him twenty five hundred bucks for those two weeks. Uh, commission thirty three grand. So radio works. And without further ado, let's get to Greg Harrelson and the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents have built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go! Yeah! yeah. Today on the show, super excited about having this guy on, on. As you all know, I talk with the top people in the nation, and this guy is top 1% nationwide, number one guy in Myrtle Beach. I'm thrilled to welcome Greg Harrelson. Hey, Greg, thanks for taking the time out today. Yeah, man, I'm excited to, to, to make the connection. All right. Hey, so listen, I've given the audience a brief overview of your background, but maybe take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then, and then what you have going on today. Okay. Well, hey, you know, I've been in the business about uh, 19, 20 years. I came into the business as a young guy who was uh, trying to uh, finish college, never really finished college, and, and started as a part-time telemarketer for my dad, who was a uh, already a pretty decent real estate agent in my local market. And, you know, next thing you know, a couple years later, I said that, hey, this seems to be working. I seem to be okay at doing some prospecting. Why don't I get my... Uh, get uh, become a full-time real estate agent and now we're 20 minutes uh, 20 years later and here I am I'm just still uh punching out numbers how funny so 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 you thought you know look I talk to guys like you every now and again and like you you people like you are sort of the unsuspecting real estate agent right you get this part-time job and all of a sudden 20 years later you're crushing it um you started as a part-time telemarketer for your dad yeah, that experience, you know, that, you know, having that sales background, you know, having that a little bit thick skin of, you know, being able to take rejection. How, how do you think that has served you in, in your you know, two decade career? Well, where, where it really served me is it opened my eyes. See, so here's what part time meant. So part time meant I came into the office at eight o'clock and I made calls for three hours a day, eight to 11. Then I went to school. Um, while I was, you know, still kind of uh, dabbling in college. And then after school, I came back in the evenings and prospected for two hours. So, so the interesting thing beyond the prospecting is I was never exposed to what a traditional real estate office looks like. Oh. There really isn't any agents in the office at eight in the morning, and there's not really many agents in the office in the evening. So I was actually in the real estate industry, but never really knew anything about what the normal real estate agent did. So in a sense, all I knew was how to generate, or all I was learning at that time is generation is the only thing that matters. And I, because I wasn't exposed to anything else, I actually thought that maybe all the other agents were coming in after I was leaving and doing the same thing. And, and so day one, all I did was generate. So even, you know, my later years, that's all I did is I said, okay, the most important thing to do is generate business every day. A day not prospecting is the same as a day not worked. And that was what developed that mindset was developed in those earlier years. Wow. So you were super fortunate. So you were all about lead generation. I got to tell you, know, I'm curious to know from you. I mean, I've had these experiences where, because um, I'm a sales guy, I've always been in sales, and I've had these experiences where, you know, there's, I have nothing. There's nothing in the pipe, and then I work hard. I get five appointments. I used to paint houses in college, right? And I remember this one weekend, I had nothing. I had 10 employees. I had nothing for them to do. I booked, I, you know, I had five appointments or six appointments over the weekend, and boom, boom, boom. I, I, I closed them all, and I realized at that point, you know, no matter what or what position or where I was, I can go out and make money tomorrow, I'm, yes. Tell yeah. me about. I'm t I want to hear from you. I mean, how, tell me about when you had a similar kind of experience. You know, well, I, you know, I was, I was. Somebody had told me, and I'm not sure who this was, whether it was a Mike Ferry or whether it was my dad or maybe even Floyd Wickman. I heard it maybe on a tape. Um, I, I had heard one time that you start off your day unemployed. Right. As a real estate professional, you start off every day unemployed, and and then it's my choice as to whether or not I go to sleep unemployed. 
So it's not my choice. I'm going to wake up, and this just we default to being unemployed when we wake up in our industry. But it is our choice as to whether or not we end the day that way. And so, you know, that's what was ingrained in my subconscious mind early on. And so then I knew, okay, it becomes just a numbers game. It's, gen about, it's, it's only about generation. If I make enough contacts, I will find somebody who will employ me. And I have to do that every single day. So it was very duplicatable and repeatable once you understood that concept. I <laughs> I love that. I just, you know, I think if everybody had that sort of mindset, right, you wake up, you're unemployed. Um, so for you, so you started as a telemarketer, right? You were doing, you were prospecting five yeah. hours a day, which is unbelievable. Yeah. D- did you always stay, you know, some people are comfortable on the phone and they, they don't get outside, um, uh, you know, and then other people kind of, they're, you know, whether that's door knocking or like talking with the guy behind you in the supermarket, how did that evolve for you? Well, it evolved. The, the way that it evolved is like, okay, you know, if, if a, a normal person could, you know, a normal generator could prospect, do telephone prospecting and make 10 t- contacts an hour, where I tried to evolve is say, how could I make 15 contacts per hour? How could I make 20 contacts an hour? So the, the, the traditional phone prospecting, you know, years ago, we didn't have auto dialers. Mm. So but it, it transformed from doing one phone dialing to double dialing and having a double headset. Then we went to, you know, okay, well, now we need to get more contacts per hour. So then we went to automated uh, uh, dialing. So it, it always stayed within the prospecting arena, within telephone, you know, prospecting. But it just evolved in how efficient we became. Once we got to a point where it says, okay, about 20 to 22 contacts per hour is about as high as you can get before you get what I call contactitis, where you're just going through the motions. Yeah. Then it evolved where we said, okay, now in order to get more, we got to hone our skills so it takes less contacts to make an actual appointment. But I always evolved within staying with the same activity, but just improving the quality of the uh, or or always looking for ways to improve my skills so I mm-hmm. can improve the return on the same amount of time. Yeah, so so you know uh, you know as we were chatting before we started recording here, you know I, I had Tom Ferry on the show and he talked a little bit about this and here's you know he said this so so tracking is everything you need to track and you need to know where you're at. On average, for all of Tom's people, all, all the people his organization coaches, it is 60, 60 phone calls to one appointment. And he said, well, we have some superstars that can, that can do 20 phone calls and get one appointment. You know, you, you, you have to be amazingly good at what you do. What is that ratio for you? Well, when I was at – so right now I do more coaching of the agents inside of my company. So hmm. I'm not picking up the phone today and making calls. But when, you know, towards the end of when I was really making a high volume of calls, I scaled mine down to about one appointment every five contacts. Wow. But but at that point, I was only making maybe 10 contacts a day and only focus on the highest quality, like an expired and FISBO type of call. You know, so I, you know, I eventually I moved away from doing all the cold calling, scaled the number of contacts down, but because the quality was so high of what I was calling, I, uh, if I made 10 contacts, I for sure was going to get two to three appointments. Got it. Amazing, man. So, so look, here's what I've seen in guys like you, right? So you have this skill, you, you can pick up the phone and, and you can make magic happen. So you, and, and really you become sort of this closing machine, right? Or just moving people, you know, through the funnel. Did you at some point realize that you were neglecting the, your past clients, right? Because you were just on the, on the, on the hunt for new, uh, new prospects, yeah, I mean, you know, and that's a great observation because because you probably hear this in people that do what I do. A lot of times we're those guys that we like to hunt, but we don't want to go collect what we just hunted. Right. You know, and so and, and it becomes a sport and we get kind of like, you know, that becomes like our passion is just to go and, and hunt it and get it and feel like, OK, we did it. But somebody else needs to go ahead and clean this thing up and prepare it, right? Yeah, right. And, and, and so, yes, I, I definitely was no different than other people that do what I do. And what I ended up doing is I just made sure that I had enough staff or had you know systems in place that would kind of force me and hold me accountable to work in those particular areas, really more of my coaching. So, or people who were my coaches at that time were always holding me accountable because they knew that was going to be where my weakness was. 
Yeah. So I just had to set up accountability structures to keep it going. And look, and I'll tell you something that this that this specific, specific topic really has not come up on the show. But th- it's, this is me, right? When I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of stuff of how I do things, and and because I'm a closer kind of a guy, I I really do have an, a hard time. Uh, you know, being that warm, fuzzy guy, right? Calling back my, calling my past clients going, Hey, Greg, what's going on? Like what, you know, you know, b- building that relationship is, is a little bit tough for me. It's easier for me just to go find somebody new. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think there's a bunch of people that are, 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 are like that. The key is, is being aware of that. So yeah. if you'll admit it, then the, 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 the likelihood is, is that we're going to be able to find somebody that can do par- that part of our business way better than you and I can. Right. But what so many people do is, is they're in denial. They don't want to admit that because it's like admitting a weakness. But in, 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 my, in, in my mind, it's like once I'm aware of that, then I can easily set up the infrastructure to make sure that that becomes a strength, not a weakness. Got it. So, so um, for you, 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 know, you spend most of your time now coaching. Now, this is, you, you just, you're not coaching other people outside of your team. It's, it's just your team, right? That is correct. So I own three different real estate offices, mm. uh, two in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, one in Charleston, uh, with a, approximately 60 real estate agents. So in my mind, I own a coaching company. I have 60 coaching clients. Wow. And, but, it, but that's just kind of the, my mental approach to the way I run my companies. But I'm not coaching outside of those companies. So let me ask you this. I'm, I'm curious about just, you know, so, so two things. We, you know, NAR, there's a bunch of stats out there, right? So one stat is only 2% of, of real estate agents make more than 200 grand a year. And mm-hmm. there's another stat that says it's a crazy washout number. It's literally like 75% of people who get into real estate don't last past the first 12 months. Mm-hmm. When you were going out and people come to you and say, hey, Greg, I want to join, you know, you're this great coach, you've had this great background, you're the number one guy, I want to join your team. What kind of things are you looking for uh, in people that you bring into your company? You know, one of the things that I'm looking for is if they're coachable. Mm. And, and, and what's interesting about that is you can't just ask somebody, hey, Toby, are you coachable? Because obviously the answer is yes. Yeah. So, you know, in, in an earlier stage of a conversation, I might ask somebody something like, hey, you know, have you ever, you know, ever had a coach or is there ever a coach or a mentor, you know, from your past that, you know, has really stuck out and can you tell me about a time when you were coached and it really made a big difference? And then sometimes people say, well, I've never had a coach or, or some people give me these amazing stories of like, yeah, I had this coach when I was in high school and they did this and they did that. Well, that right there, depending on how they answer, that tells me whether or not they understand the coach-player relationship because it is a very um, authoritative, subordinate-like relationship. You know, not dominant, but authority, subordinate-like relationship. And so if they've got a history of, of in their childhood of being in that type of relationship, then I know they're going to be comfortable with me coaching them. That's one of the things that I look for. And then I'm also looking for a desire to, you know, I, I'm looking for that person that when they play Monopoly with their friends, they get in an argument. Um, but after the Monopoly game is over, they're not upset. You know, in other words, they have that strong desire. They just want to win and they, they want to be the best that they can be. But they're not going to cry when they lose. Right. And so I'm, that's what I'm looking for is coachability. I'm looking for people to have a desire to succeed. And then I'm looking for people that will follow structure. Mm. You know, are you this guy that you coming into the business because you heard that, you know, um, you know, this is I got freedom of my time and I can just come and go when I want to. That's not for me. I'm looking for somebody that says, hey, you won't have to work long hours, but you're going to have to be pretty intense in the hours that you do work. And this is what the schedule looks like. If you'll follow that structure, then I can coach you. And a lot of people will run away right there because they're saying, no, I've already had a a, a job where I have to clock in and clock out. I don't want structure. That's why I'm getting into real estate. So that eliminates them right then. But those are the three things that I'm looking for. Interesting. You know, it, it's it's so funny that you you, you touch on that point. You, first of all, you, there's a lot of stuff that you said there that I want to dig into. But you know, a lot of people get into real estate because they want time freedom and they want financial freedom. The problem yes. is they abuse the time freedom and they'll never ever get the financial freedom because of that. Yes, I mean financial freedom is something that's earned, and what we have to do is we have to invest time to do it. So what they're doing is they don't want to invest the time, but they want the to pull the investment out. It just doesn't work that way. 
So, so earlier you talked about this authority and, and being subordinate. And uh, I want to dig into that a little bit because I recently had this guy on the show, Rick Ruby. I don't know if you know Rick. Oh, yeah. Okay. I know Rick. So yeah. I had Rick on the show, and Rick, uh, uh, he's got a very, you know, uh, a strong, strong personality. And he was like, what he told me is like, hey, with the, with the people that I coach, I want them to surrender. And I'm like, man, like you're that <laughs> like surrender. Like who's going to do that? Uh, but he said, just do what I say and, and I can double your, your production. Yes. What is your viewpoint on that? Is it, uh, because look, I help people too. I coach people. I, the show is coaching people. And I have some people who say, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I have other people who say, listen, I have these ideas, but I, I need help refining them. You know, Maybe unpack, unravel that, that what I just said, if you could. Yeah, so, so the term surrender, I, that, you know, you know there's, it doesn't mean they have to be submissive and they don't have to bow down. That is not necessarily what surrender means. But I would share that same thought that, that Rick has. But maybe my, my approach would be different, would be have faith. Like just kind of mm. give up yeah. with what you think it needs to look like and allow me to share this information and take it on and have faith and follow it through, execute. And then at the end, after you fully execu- execute it, then we'll judge whether or not it was the right thing or the wrong thing. But in the beginning, you have to surrender. You have to have faith. You kind of have to give up your own ego. And that's how I would say, I, how I would describe the term surrender. But I do think it's, it, 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 it's very relevant. Um, and, and then when it comes to coaching, I mean, you know, I think some of the best coaches that lead their teams, what they're doing is they're not trying to, they, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like cooking a frog when it comes to, to agents. The, the way that you don't cook a frog is you don't put a frog in boiling hot water because it'll just jump right out. Right. What you have to do is you have to kind of take the water that the frog came from Put it in there, and it'll just kind of relax, and it's like this feels comfortable, and then slowly turn up the heat, and next thing you know, the frog's cooked, and no one even realized it, and I think that's the approach that we have to take with, 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 with coaching our real estate agents is we have to get into their world, and we have to understand what their comfort is, and then slowly turn up the heat. And if they have trust in you as the leader, they're going to allow that to take place. And once they start seeing the results, then they're going to be addicted. And, and then the real player coach relationship can start. Got it. That, uh, what a great analogy, man. I mean, have faith and slowly turn up the heat. So let me ask you this. You know, a lot of people, you know, real estate, if you, for the most part, right, if you, if you are, are certainly familiar with the DISC profile. Yeah. Um, and, if, and I, you know, everybody in the audience, if you, if you're not send me an email, I'll send you a link. You can take the test, but you know, so most, uh, agents are, you know, moderately high on the D and, yeah. and high on the I, right. Very gregarious people. Um, um, I have two questions. One, you know, people that are high D high I, you know, are, 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 do they find it harder to have faith or surrender in that, in that regard? And two, if you're not high I, if you're not super gregarious, I know you, you can still win and, and succeed in real estate, but, but what are the methods, right? Those are two different personalities that will win in yeah. d- very different ways. So maybe I'm, yeah. I know, I'm, I'm giving you these big, long questions, and I, I, it's my <laughs> fault. I need to break them in thirds. But maybe, maybe talk about you know, the personality types in that regard. Yeah, so um, first of all, somebody that's a high I, let's just say they're more gregarious, uh, and, and they're maybe more expressive, right? Yeah. Then, you know, they're – they're the type of people that would appeal more to the buyer side of the transaction mm. because people buy off emotion. People sell off logic. So if you're a high D, then you're typically more black and white and you're probably more logical in the way that you evaluate and the way that you present because sellers sell off logic, that, then that's the perfect personality. But those that are a little bit more expressive by nature – Buyers buy off emotion, so those are the people that tend to be better buyer's agents. Now, I'm not going to be the person that tells you what you should be, but what I've seen historically is that people, based on their personality, they tend to enjoy and excel in one side of the transaction more than they do the other. And I for that. I I don't – I I look. I, I explain to people what I just said to you. But then I sit back and a new agent comes in and I kind of observe and what will happen is I'll tell them all the things they need to know in the first 30, 
to 90 days to get some business. And then all of a sudden, you'll see that they start focusing on one side of the transaction more. They stop prospecting, but they start working more buyers or vice versa. And I can tell you, it always falls in line with what their personalities are. That is very, very interesting. I think that's that's very intuitive of you. I mean, I, I, you're the first per- person that came on the show and has um, – Deliver it in that way. So, so somebody who is, you know, let, let me. What if somebody is low I, right? So they're they're more introverted uh, than extroverted. Uh, you know, they're timid. They don't they don't feel good with uh, about the word sales. They don't feel good if they feel like they're selling somebody. You know, how can those people go out? Because I mean, look again. There's people out there like that who go, man, I want to win in real estate, but I just I don't feel good about sales, and and I'm a little bit introverted. Yeah. So the person who has a, um, you know, a fear of being of calling themselves a salesperson, because there is a lot of those out there. Yeah. They just don't want to be known as salesperson. And, and so, you know, there's a difference. I mean, I could ask one person, hey, how many ho- homes do you want to sell this year? Or I can ask the question differently. How many families would you like to serve this year? So how many families would you like to assist them in moving into their dream home or assist them in relocating back to where they come from? So that type of language is the language that we would need to talk to, talk, that we'd need to use to influence an agent that wants to avoid being a salesperson. Because that person that doesn't want to sell, what they're thinking is, is they probably had an experience in their childhood where their mom or dad said, I hate salespeople. So the last thing they want to do is become a salesperson, and then they're exactly what is going to disappoint their parents. Even though that's a deep thing to be thinking about, that's yeah. probably what's going on. So the, so the opposite of, of selling somebody something would be serving somebody. Mm. And so we just have to change the language. So if I'm coaching you and you're that type of personality, I'm not going to ask you how many homes you want to sell. Right. I'm not going to talk to you about this script is what you're going to use to close people down. I might say this is the way you need to communicate to make sure that they're experiencing what you're, what you're wanting to accomplish here. Yeah. You know, so I change the language. That's good. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, it's funny. So, so I know you work with, with Mike Ferry, and, uh, yeah. and as we talked earlier, Mike's been on the show. You know, Mike's system is very, you know, it's really simple, right? It's, it's make the call, go out, and ask for the business. That's it. Um, and I had, I won't say his name, but I had one of Mike's coaches on here, and, and as we talked, I said, I, we were talking about expires. I said, how do you, you know, what do people do with expires? And he tells me this thing. He's like, hey, uh, this is what you should do. Uh, 745 in the morning, go to that expires, go to their house. And I said, okay, you go to their house. What do you say? He's like, here's what you say. Hi, Mr. Seller. Uh, we have an emergency. Um, your house is unrepresented right now. And and I'm like, I'm like, man, you, I mean, do you know what kind of cojones it takes to do that? Like not, I mean, there's a very small portion of people that can do that. Mm-hmm. So my, <laughs> yeah. So Mike, I, I want you to jump in there. So in terms of you have sixty coaching clients because that's what you have. You know, that's, you have sixty team members. Um, is that the kind of thing that that you uh, that you promote, or is that the kind of thing that you teach? Yeah, I mean, whether it's that exact script or or, or not, but yes, I, I promote that a very taking a very active approach to lead generation. Okay, whether it be knocking on doors or you know prospecting and others active meaning we're going to go out and create something versus wait for something to to happen and and so absolutely now you you have to understand when we're dealing with you know 60 uh you know people in my company or whether mike ferry's dealing with you know two thousand people in his coaching company you know it's very important that the coach once again understand their client their coaching client the person that they're coaching and, and figure out where those barriers are. I mean, my job is not to make, take you from a, a two to a 10 in, 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 in one month. It's just to get you to, you know, maybe be comfortable doing a, a three or, you know, just move you up one layer, one notch at a time slowly. And, and so you don't get as much resistance as you would think as long as, you, as, long as there are a, there's a system that helps them progress to those things. And then there's going to be personalities that are just going to say, no, I'm never going to knock on a door. And that's perfectly fine. There are many ways to generate income in this real estate industry. And we just have to find the ones that, you know, that particular person's willing to engage in. Got it. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's a, that's a whole method of turning, slowly turning up the heat and, you know, slowly, yeah. slowly getting out of your comfort zone. So, so, you know, you have a, you've had a career of 20 years. That's a long time to be doing anything, you know, the same thing over and over again. You've seen a lot of agents come and go. If, yeah. if you had to, if you had to like 
pick one theme or, or one thing that where you see most new agents uh, or, or, or aspiring agents fall down and fail, what is that one thing that you see where, you, you know, I'm sure you can just see people's business go, man, if you just change that one thing, so many more things would fall into place. They, they don't understand that real estate is a contact sport. Got it. It's all contacts. And so- Every transaction starts with a contact. It doesn't matter how you get the transaction. It is, starts with a contact. And if you don't understand the, the ratios and the numbers, and if you don't treat this business as if it's a real business, which is you track your numbers, you evaluate the numbers, and you adjust accordingly, then, you're, then you're, the chances of succeeding is very unlikely. So as a new agent that's coming in, most of them never understand that that's what, how, how the top producers become top producers. Right. And you know, it's funny. We have, we have a, a very strong Twitter tribe out there. And I, I got to tell you, I know for a fact that people are going to tweet that left and right. Real estate is a contact sport. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you were, I think, again, I said it earlier, but you're very fortunate that you got your start with being a telemarketer, right? You were, you know, you, you got used to uh, being rejected. Um, you know, and, and I'll ask this, you know, real estate is a, is a business of no's. It's a business of rejection. And sometimes you, you know, you get rejected and, you know, deals fall apart and, you, and there's those days or weeks where you just go, man, and you, know, you feel like you got kicked in the gut and you're like, I can't do, I can't get up and go through this again. Did, mm-hmm. Tell me about a time when, when, you know, did you ever feel like that? And how did you push through that roadblock to find success? You know, I, I tell you, I hate to say this, um, you know, because it's sometimes unbelievable, but I really didn't have a, an issue with rejection. And I, you know, I mean, there might be times where I've had some times where like, I'm getting bored, right? And I'm yeah. getting complacent. And, um, but rejection is just not something that's really ever been an issue. But, but here's the reason I think is, and I caught on to something that you just said, you know, you got to go through all these no's. Here's the deal. If it's going to take me hypothetically, 200 contacts to get a listing and make a sale. Let's just say it's going to take me 200 contacts to get a listing and for that listing to sell. Yeah. So that means I went through 199 no's and one yes. But the time I invested, the expense that I incurred is an expense for the entire 200 contacts. So when I take my commission check, Let's say it's five thousand dollars. Mm. In order to assess a real value on my time, I have to include the time it took to get the nose. So I'll take the two hundred contacts, divide into the five thousand uh, dollars, and whatever that is. Let's just say that's a you know two hundred and fifty dollars or twenty. Maybe it's twenty five dollars. I'm not sure what that is, but whatever that number is, then that's how much I make per contact. So I actually make more money on the no's than I do on the yes. I made $25 times 199 and only yeah. $25 for the one contact. So it's like, man, so if somebody, let's just say somebody was to hang up on me because that would be a way, a form of rejection. Most people would be like, oh my gosh. I'm thinking, I was like, dude, thank goodness that person hung up on me. They only cost me five seconds. They could have cost me five minutes. Yeah. I made $25 in five seconds. I can't wait for the next one. The yeses are just going to come statistically over time. So that's where it's like, man, I I never thought of it as rejection. I thought every no was was X amount of dollars to me. That is awesome, man. That is, aw- I love that. I really love that illustration. You know, I had somebody come on the show and, and illustrate it in a different way. And, and, and this is what she does. She, for her, she's very strong with mining her past clients. And she knows for every 13 calls, she's going to get a deal, right? For every 13 calls, she's going to get a deal. So what she does is she puts 12 paper clips up. And when she makes a call, she pulls that paper clip down. But the 13th one, instead of a paper clip, it's a $100 bill. So she can see it. She's like, okay, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's great. I, I hope people in, in, you know, implement that notion of every no is worth 25 bucks. And, and, uh, and, and you know, 200 calls, I, that's really low, right? I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's really, really high. Most people are going to do it much quicker than that. Yeah, we just built in a, a scenario. You know, it's just like the, it's, it's the formula. Right. It's like because so, so many people, they get excited, you know, they'll go for two days and they prospect and they don't get anything. And then on the third day, they get like two appointments. Right. And so the first two days, they're all disappointed. And the, and the third day, they're all excited. It's like, what about this roller coaster ride? Because statistically, over time, your ratios are what your ratios are. 
every contact that you made for the last two days is is just as important as the one yes that you get on the third day. Yeah. I agree. So, so you know, in 2014, I'm, I, you know, so you've been through a couple booms and a couple busts. Mm -hmm. um, um, how, you know, and I think especially now, in, you know, in 2014, you need to be really agile. How did you, you know, what did you do in, you know, let's go back to 08, for example, right? We mm -hmm. come off this boom, like everything's going crazy, uh, you know, from 01 to 07, then all of a sudden 08 happens, Lehman fails, the world is melting. How did, how did you adjust your business at that time? Well, the the reality is, is it was anybody that's trying to adjust at that time was way too late. So if, if you're really looking at the numbers and you're, you know, by the time 08 came, that's when the media took on and said, life is over, real estate's over. That was when the media got it. But a good real estate agent that understands their market, they should have seen that in 2006. Hmm. Uh, just by looking at certain numbers, like, you know, what is the average list to sales price? You know, is there more negotiating going on? Days on market, you know. And so what happened, we got fooled because in a lot of markets, the days on market was like 10 days. And, and that's how it was in my market. But when I saw the market go from 10 days on average to make a sale to 15 days, most of us would look at that and say, well, that's no big deal. I'm still selling them, you know, as fast as can be. But no, that was a 50% increase in the days on market. And you have to turn those things into percentages. And when you start to look at those things, then I said to myself, and I'm not claiming that I predicted the bust. But what I did do is I said, something doesn't look right, so let's go ahead and start acting, performing as if we're already in a down market, and then whatever happens, if it does happen, we're ready, and if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't matter. Interesting. So that, that's really what we did. So we were, we were already changing our, our you know, what we were doing inside the company um, probably two years before, but now my market didn't bust in 2008. It really busted in 2007. So at the beginning of 2006 is when we started preparing for it. Got it. Uh, that's interesting uh, that 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 you look at the data like that. So so how is business? If you look, if you compare like 06, 06 was a great year. You know, 05. Let's mm -hmm. say 05. 05 was a great year everywhere. Um, how how is business different from 05 and, to, and to, you know, if somebody is going to build their business today, how is it different now than it was then? Well, if I was going to go into the business and start to build it, you know, and try to become a top producer, I wouldn't change anything that I did. Now, the ratios may be different. So we have to look at the ratios. But I would get up. I'd be in the office. I'd prospect three hours a day in the morning. And then depending on how aggressive I wanted to grow, I might do some more evening prospect a few nights a, uh, you know, a, few nights a week. So I would not change the methods that I use to grow. But we would have to monitor your numbers to see what the ratios are. So the ratios might be different in a down market versus a hot market. So it might take more contacts or less contacts to get the same amount of business. But the methods that we use would be the same. Got I'm it. teaching the same methods today as I was teaching before to build top producers. Now, it, 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 it's as simple as that. It's just the ratios may be different. Right. And, and, you know, and, and I was actually looking for a, an answer similar to that because you know, in, in reality, a guy like you, with, you're, you're a, you know, a lead generator guy, right? So you're going to you – know, the, again, the rate you, you said a minute ago, the ratios are going to be different in a lot of ways – you know, I could frame what you've done, Greg, in a different ways. You have built your business uh, that is independent of the outside market. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I mean, if you know, I don't, I don't pray that you know the market's ever going to go down. But the reality is, is when the market goes down, it's kind of like when the tide goes out, you you see who's swimming naked. Yeah. When the market goes down, you see who the skilled real estate agents are, and because there's less agents in the business, then there's fewer people that, that get to go after a bigger piece of pie. So, I mean, a, a, a real good, in my opinion, the, 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 the top agents that are really skilled actually gain market share in a down market. Yeah. They don't gain it in an up market. They gain it in a down market. Right. You know, and again, going back to 05, there's lots of people who thought they were rock stars. Oh, man. And, and then yeah. realized they were not when the, when the markets are good. So, so, again, you're heavy prospecting. I, I love that idea. A lot of people struggle with that. They're, even if they're, they're comfortable with making calls or knocking on doors, you know, where do you – I mean, what list do you prospect? I mean, do you, do you use Red X or Land Voice Data or, you know, what, what list do you prospect through? If you're new, yeah. not, not you. I mean, you have a giant past, you know, client list. Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah. So we, I, I, I've used, we've used Red X and Land Voice. I mean, Cole's directory, you know, is you know where you can get a lot of numbers for the residential numbers. You know, all of those services that offer offer numbers, or you know, the Red X will give us the FISBOs and the uh, and the and the expired to deliver to us every morning before we're even awake. You know, those are the services that we're using. And so, and those, and so, so basically, you know, uh, again, we have a deal with Land Voice. So if anybody wants to use Land Voice, you can try it out for free just using landvoicedata.com slash superagentslive. Um, yeah. But so do you pick a geographic farm and go, okay, you know, because again, Land Voice or Red X, I'm sure can do that. You know, you pick this area and then is that who you just comb through or, or. Yeah, well, we'll we, you know, we don't do a lot of geographic farming, but what we hmm. will do is we'll call behind our just solds. So depending on where we've sold that week is going to dictate the list that we're going to pull and call. Interesting. <clears throat> Interesting. So you have it just sold and then you, and then you would call that area. Now, do you ever, do you ever uh, mail it as well or you just, just call, they, they get added to the list or not? We're, we don't do a lot of mailing. I mean, we do do some mailing. We don't do a ton. And, and, and the, what, would, what would determine if I was doing a mail is if I really wanted to capture a large portion of the market share in a particular community, then I would create a 12-month marketing calendar uh-huh. where we would uh, do a mail, a mail campaign, an email campaign, and a call campaign. Got it. Okay. So for a guy like you, Greg, if you know you are just a guy out there, just give me a list of numbers and I'm going to comb through it. I'm going to find the nuggets of gold in there. So, so that means that you don't really have a niche. Like you're just a general business guy. You will sell whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I do believe that, that some of the most stable um, uh, real estate, uh, you know, team businesses or, or companies are those that diversify in inventory. I think it's hmm. very dangerous to actually go and be too niche hmm. because, you know, and I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So those companies that were all niche on the ocean front, when the uh, resort market took a tank, I mean, those companies went out of business or if they did survive, they definitely, you know, spent their last 10 years worth of wealth uh, just to keep their doors open. Yeah. And so, you know, even though I was heavy into the oceanfront condos, I was also heavy into the residential homes. So when one market wasn't doing so well, there was still another market there. So I think diversification in your inventory is critical. That is really interesting. Uh, most people that come on the show will say, hey, you know, you really have to have a niche. And, you know, people will come on and say, listen, you know, I only do downtown condos, all right? I won't do a resident. If it's a residential or it's a, a commercial, you know, I, just, I just pass it along. Yeah. I think that's the difference in building production and building a business. Interesting. You know, so I don't think as, as a producer, you know, that might be okay. But as a business person, that's very risky. Interesting, man. Um, so, so, uh, so you're just a very, very old school guy. So wh- what about, I mean, do you use social media at all? Or is it basically give me a phone, give me a list, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna... <laughs> to... I'm going to find whoever wants to buy or sell on that list. I mean, I, we, we have no social media strategies for generating. Got I it. mean, am I on Facebook? Sure I am. Do yeah. I post things? Sure I do. It's, there's no strategy for generating. Look, dude, I, my business is very boring. <laughs> okay? You know, okay. so, you know, the key with me and the way that I run my, my operation is you have to master repetitious boredom. And I feel like that's really what we have mastered is we have mastered repetitious boredom. But if you think about it, we look at Michael Jordan. That's what he did. He mastered repetitious boredom. And that's why one day in a game he closed his eyes and he shot a free throw and it went in. So he, in order to be that good at what he had, what he was at his, at his sport, he had to do it over and over and over and over again. And so if you look at the true legends in, in, in any sport, those guys had the most boring lives. They sat on the golf course and took the same putter and practiced the same putt in the same location hundreds of times and then moved it two inches and did it again hundreds of times. That's a very boring thing to do, but that's why they actually made the millions they made. That is really interesting, man. So that's the you know this this is the the ten thousand hour rule. Like, who said that? Mm, um, yes. Uh, who? Malcolm Gladwell, right? You, yes. You have to ten thousand hours, and then you become a true expert. Uh, mm-hmm. So there you go, man. Uh, I, we we got to start wrapping up, but uh, I think I've gotten everything I can out of you. You know, it's 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 a contact sport. Get the ten thousand hours. Get bored and get fine with that. 
um, is, is there anything else that that uh, that you know for the people listening and they they resonate with this? You know, what else do you think? Here, here, let me. Th- this is a question I ask very very few people, but I'm ask you. What is one thing I didn't ask you, but I should have asked you? Hmm. That's a good question. That's a, that's a tough one. I, I, I would say, you know, in, in how are things changing? in the industry and how does that impact because of automation with lead generation is being so automated how does that actually change the game um, from somebody who does old school prospecting that might be a, a question that would be a very valid question and how would you answer that yeah so my my answer is this and because I have been asked this question I've thought about it it's a fantastic question is the key is as lead generation becomes automated then what's happening is we're using technology to connect us with the consumer. As more and more consumers are connected through technology, they become disconnected when it comes to actual intimate relationships. So what's amazing is most agents are moving to technology to do the lead generating. There's fewer people making personal contacts. When we're making personal contacts, it's almost looked at, oh, wow, you guys are actually calling me? Wow, I haven't talked to any realtors in a long time. So it's interesting as we become more connected, like via social media, Mm -hmm. like how many fans and friends you have, we become more disconnected. So in a way, technology is disconnecting us when it comes to more of relationship, intimate relationships, but it may be connecting us when it comes to more reach. So what we're focusing on in our calls is making sure that in our communication, we're not using sales language, we're using serving language. And that's one thing that is becoming fewer, it's, it's harder and harder to find people who will communicate from a contribution type of language versus a I want language. And mm. all, all the technologies out there that are collecting leads are real flashy, real gimmicky. And, and we're seeing that that's actually putting us, giving us an advantage. Very interesting. Um, and really quickly, uh, so like, what does that script sound like? What does that serving language sound like when you call me? Well, you know, I'm still going to say, hey, you know, Toby, we just sold a property. And, you know, when one sells, you know, a lot of times another one will sell right away. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, when do you plan on moving? You say never. I said, okay, fantastic. You know, how long have you been in the community? So instead of just bailing on you because right, you said right, no, right. we're actually going to get to get an understanding of like who you are. And this has to be done very quick. But then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to say, well, you know, I appreciate the time and it doesn't sound like you're going to do anything. But, you know, one thing that uh, a lot of your neighbors have asked me to do is they've asked me to keep in touch with them and just, you know, give them an idea if there's any changes in the market. I mean, Toby, you know that. Anytime the market shifts, a lot of times that can have a make, major impact on your investment. What is your email address? I'll make sure you get the same information. Got it. Now, now all of a sudden, that person coughs up their email address, allows me to communicate, and then depending on what I'm sending them is going to dictate whether or not they see me as a giver or a taker. Awesome. So I'm never going to send anything that says, hey, you should list with me. I'm going to say, hey, here's some things that are going on in the market. Call, let me know if you ever need any information. I love it. I love what CRM do you use, Greg? Infusionsoft. Got it. Um, well, it's, it's, uh, that's an expensive one. That's like 200 bucks a month, right? Um, for me, I'm spending a lot more of that because wow. my all my 60 agents are in it. Got it. So, Got it. Um, but it does some amazing things that you can't do with any other CRMs. Got it's it. It's an intelligent CRM, so it's very predictive. Well, well, Greg, hey, man, I, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, I'm going to ask you the same two last questions I ask everybody. Here's the first one. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? What book should you go buy? Yeah, book. 25 bucks. I would, I would actually go buy The One Thing by Gary Keller. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And look, if, any, if, if you guys out in the audience have not read that, you can get a free copy. Use our link, audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. My last question to you, Greg, before I let you go, do you have any personal habits that you feel have contributed to your success? Um, I, a characteristic, I would say, is I, I just – I love to compete at anything at all times. And I would say that personality is almost a habit that everything is almost becomes a competition, at least in my mind. And, and I think that fuels me – 
to really push, push and get everything I can out of the things that I, that I engage in. Got it. Perfect. Well, listen, I'm, I'm sure you're always on the look for talent. So anybody that's out there in the Myrtle Beach area, where, where are other your offices, Greg? It's uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Charleston, South Carolina. There you go. Reach out to Greg. And, and you know, if somebody says, hey, I love, I love you know, the message that Greg has, where can people go out, find you, say thank you for coming on the show, or say, hey, man, I want to join your team? You know, you can email me at gregharrelson at gmail.com, or I'm on Facebook, too. Thanks, bud. Hey, I really appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you so much. See you, Greg.